Okay, we can get started. Um, hi, everybody. Literally, everybody who's here knows who I am. So I'm, I'm not going to introduce myself. Um, but I will um, introduce our two awesome panelists. This panel is the Woman Life Freedom Revolution in Iran panel. Um, and I'm going to introduce uh, I'm going to read the bios of our two panelists, and then we will go. Um, Kupe Misagi is a writer, translator, and editor. Her debut book, Transla Transrelating House One, amazing novel, was published in 2020. And her second book, Can't Wait to Read It, Sound Museum, is forthcoming next year, both from Coffee House Press. Poupe's most recent translation, In the Streets of Tehran, a book of witness narratives, is published by Bonnier Books UK uh, in this, this past fall in October. She also has another novel in translation forthcoming in 2024. An assistant professor of literary arts and studies at the University of Denver, and a faculty uh, mentor here in the Low Residency Creative Writing Program. Poupe is currently based in Denver, Colorado. Poupe, is that where you are right now? Yes, that's where I am right now. You're in Denver. Poupe is in Denver. <laughs> awesome. And then Sanaz Masumi is a Persian fashion designer and textile artist, passionate about making unique fashion items and accessories. Through her work, she looks for elegance, sophistication, and uniqueness with a vision in her designs inspired by nature, society, history, culture, and craft. Art and being around art is like breathing for Sanaz. Her endless passion for artistic creation has led her to pursue it both academically and professionally. Oh, I realize I didn't turn this on. And professionally. With more than 10 years working as a fashion designer, interior designer, and creative director while managing her brand in her home country, currently, Sanaz is, is about to graduate, on the precipice of graduating with her MFA uh, in the Applied Craft and Design Program here at PNCA. And uh, super excited, Sanaz, for your um, thesis exhibition stuff, which is, which is upcoming. <laughs> Um, thank you both for being here. Um, I'm really excited to talk to both of you. Um, Poupe, we talked about this in January of 2023. We had a community practice day, a uh, Woman Life Freedom Community Practice Day, um, in which we had conversations. Um, we did a reading of translated Persian texts. We also had a community art project um, that Sonaz actually uh, was also a part of. So the three of us have been together before. It's like a reunion for us in a way. Um, so we're gonna start the, I'm gonna ask both Pupe and Sonaz to just talk about, well, one, what their art practice is and how it's connected to the woman life freedom movement in Iran. Um, but also maybe in, in that, ask the both of you to also talk about just, I mean, Pupe, you and I talked a lot about this, but talk about your experience of witnessing that revolution, that revolution um, uh, you know, from from a distance, um, maybe geographic distance, but not psychic distance or social media distance. Um, so kind of the the story around it, too. So we'll start with Poupe and then um, we'll go to Sanaz. So take it away, Poupe. Um, thanks, Jay, for that introduction. Um, lovely to be here. Um, thanks for the participants. Um, well, let's see, um, where do I start? Um, 
As Jay said, I um, do both writing and um, translation and editorial work. Um, and in all of these areas and capacities, um, my work is very much tied to issues of social justice, feminism, um, global solidarities, um, people's movements. Um, and part of that work is um, done through language and arts. Um, so that's uh, where my focus has been in um, the several years that I have been uh, writing and working and teaching here in the US. Um, kind of like giving a chronological background, I think that helps like when I uh, was doing my master's here at Hopkins University, um, the 2009 protests happened in Iran. Um, which um, then um, got labeled as the Green Movement Revolution. Um, I was there during those protests um, on break from school, like visiting back home, um, working on my thesis. And um, I realized that uh, what I was writing about um, those protests, about being in the streets um, was part of my um, thesis at the time. Um, so that ended being like a novella that I submitted for my thesis called A Ghost Nation, which was about life in Tehran and also um, just um, being part of the protests, um, fighting for one's rights and like, um, um, yeah. So then I thought I was done with that topic, um, but then I wasn't. Um, I started a PhD program um, in Denver um, and then um, some of the work I was writing again um, was about like life in Tehran, the art scene in Tehran, um, and in connection to that, um, doing a lot of like investigation work um, and doing documentary politics about um, people who were killed in 2009 protests or in the aftermath of that, because the killings continued even like a few years after the movement. Uh, was cracked down. Um, so then a new manifestation of that work and that engagement um, came to life. Uh, and that was my dissertation at school, which then changed into my first book, Translating House One. Um, and then throughout all of this time, translation has been also like one of my important activities because um, Two reasons. Um, I like working between languages. I think it's important to not just do my own work, but also like help other people's stories that I like and enjoy be shared with a larger public English reading audience. But also um, when I started translating into English, um, I was seeing this is less true, but still true. There's a lot of like, emphasis and like marketing done around like stereotypical stories from the Middle East, especially from women from the Middle East. Um, and I wanted to work with alternative stories, um, which were not just about cliche images of women from Iran and the region. Um, so there was some engagement with like um, sociopolitical aspects in that choice and the kind of words that I have been doing. And that doesn't necessarily mean translating political work. It could simply be like stories that are complicating the narrative. It could just be about like friends having fun or people getting high on weed and just like um, having dreams or things like that. So it's like just like opening up that landscape of narrative um, to more stories and voices. Um, but when... The Women Life Freedom Revolution started when the protests started. I was here in Denver. I was, um, I had recently relocated from New York. Um, and um, I started to do a lot of work on campus, not just like um, through language, but also like putting together with two other people on campus, um, putting together an exhibition, like a multimedia exhibition, planning many events to try to educate 
the students and like the larger campus community, um, but also like to just hold space for our own Iranian community at um, University of Denver. So that work moved um, beyond the page onto just like um, event curation, exhibition curation as well. And meanwhile, um, I did um, edit a series of um, translations for um, the journal Words Without Borders, which is like one of the most important journals of literature and translation here in the US. Um, so every few weeks, we um, published a few pieces from Iranians on the ground in Iran or like people in diaspora who were writing about um, the movement and what it meant to be part of this historical moment. Um, the range of works went from like journalists in Iran who were writing under pen names um, to, let's see, to um, like a 16 year old, like 17 year old high school, like second generation Iranian girl here in the US to um, like a poet translating another poet, like based um, the translator based in Canada, translating someone in Iran. Um, so like a lot of like different narratives, like someone whose husband was um, arrested, um, she herself an editor and translator, and she um, would write about her trips to the prison to see her husband and all of those um, stories and memories. Um, yeah, so like a lot of a range of like coverage. Um, and one of the pieces I did for that um, series uh, was called I'm a Witness by a by an anonymous um, writer, um, which was about like the writer, a woman like going out to protest in the streets and um, like coming up and joining a group of younger girls who were protesting, taking off their scarves. Um, and then Long story short, what happened was that piece was um, acquired by a French publisher as like they asked for that piece um, to be expanded into a book. So I worked with the author in Iran. We did some editorial work, like writing consultation for a few months. Um, the author wrote the book, then um, it started to get translated into French, then the British publisher joined the team and I started to translate as well um, the book. Um, it was like one of the most intense experiences I had um, for translating just uh, because of the logistics of the work, but also because of the very short deadline. I, I think this is almost impossible in the US to go from like the book start to be written like in March last year and the publication in October. So like six months production time is almost impossible here in the US, um, but it happened. Um, and um, I even like had to help out with like editing the French, just like comparing translations and uh, with the little French that I knew. Um, so it was a lot of work, but I'm glad that it happened. Um, it's a very intimate story. So, um, I can show you like, and Ooh. this is also like interesting to look at. Like this is like the French um, publication and this is like the the British publication. So you see like they feel very different, right? But, but they are mm -hmm. the same book, but the cover tells like two different stories in a way, uh, wow. which says something about just like publishing worlds and their differences. Um, yeah, so like that has been like the trajectory, but um, I think um, the work doesn't really end, right? When you get obsessed with like um, topics and you start to investigate and explore, um, sometimes you just find that you need to do, to keep doing it in different ways and different modalities. Um, so my forthcoming book is also about like human rights uh, violations and um, very different from the previous one but um, still thinking about like the banality of evil, what Hannah Arendt talks about, right? How we all are complicit in systems of violence. Um, so 
yeah, that's where I'm still drawn to, like what I still am drawn to do. Um, and the translation also continues. Um, yeah, so I hope that's like a good overview. I hope I haven't missed anything. Um, yeah, I'll pause that's, here. We can a, come back. Yeah, that's a great overview. Thank you, Pupe. It's really good to see those books. I haven't seen them, so that's really neat. I have a, I'll, I'll throw another question at you about them. Um, Sanaz, um, would, you, would you like to um, go ahead and talk and, and feel free to share the screen whenever you're ready? Oh, okay, yes. Um, uh, hi, everyone, and thank you for being here. Um, so, uh, Okay, uh, to start is that as I was doing my personal brand in Iran as a fashion designer, uh, I started to study uh, art studies in Iran. And while studying that, I got interested like, um, you know, like I wanted to do something like uh, with the clothes I make more than just making them and selling them. Uh, so I, I I was seeing that these clothes in my society are doing more than doing more uh, something bigger. So I got interested and I started a research to uh, search uh, uh, to see the dynamics between like the fashion design and social media in Iran. Uh, I should add that like uh, as uh, Iranian fashion designers uh, doesn't, we doesn't, we don't have like catwalk fashion show in Iran and Instagram or Facebook earlier was the only way to show our work as designers. So Instagram plays kind of a role of like a catwalk fashion show for Iranian designers. But on the other hand, giving this opportunity to the designers, it means so many more designers could add to this uh, like uh, social media panel and how they started by bringing new designs and creativity uh, to the like very uh, very uh, very like limited color palette designs like uh, was uh, available in the market, bringing that kind of change. So through my work, I'm trying to search about the transformative role of fashion and style in the society. And like how fashion is not, is not just about clothing, it is a form of resistance and in empowerment uh, in daily life for Iranian women. Like each Iranian woman every day when they choose what to wear and how, with, uh, with their like uh, what, with the style that they won't go at, it's a kind of uh, resistance and fight. Uh, when I was doing research in Iran, I was through the like just putting all the photos of social media together. I was so, seeing the removal of hijab. How during uh, last ten years, the the scarf form is uh, like getting smaller and smaller to that through the Women Life Freedom Revolution, we see the act of burning scarves. Although as students in the Art University of Tehran, we used to wear uh, like shawls instead of that magnae form, uh, Islamic form. And we did uh, the act of burning magnae when they asked us to change the form of your hijab. But now it's so good to see that all people in the streets doing that. Um, so through my work, uh, uh, I'm gonna share my screen here.
So when uh, Islamic revolution happened in Iran, these kind of rules around women life uh, uh, came through our life, like compulsory hijab, modesty standard, dress code informants, and a lot of restrictions um, uh, around uh, daily life in uh, for women. Do you see my screen now? Oh, um, so Sanaz, we're not seeing the any of the photos yet. Do you want me to do it on my end or do you want to try again? So let me try because <laughs> so after Islamic revolution, one of the uh, rules uh, come around like daily life in uh, for women was school uniforms. And as students in Iran from like age of six to then all university and then uh, most of workplaces, we have to follow kind of this uh, uh, dress code. And I'm t in my uh, uh, thesis, uh, I am trying to talk about how like uh, taking the power of choice in like uh, choosing what to wear in your daily life uh, how could affect the uh, like the shaping your identity so I think a school uniform was a way of like stealing our identity as a person and we can see in the like uh, science in the psychology that how it is important to like they em emphasize on like uh, while you, uh, your children is growing, giving them the power the power of choice to choose what to wear, and so I'm through my artwork. Uh, I'm trying to show that like how uh, Iranian woman by and with the help of like fashion designer in the society uh, uh, started to changing like this restrictive form of like a school uniforms to like a stylish and like up to date way of clothing. So if you go to the next pages, different brands on social media in Iran. So I'm talking about how media and like the concept of like globalization uh, has helped us like uh, to has helped women to fashion and style their like uh, accept their identity and like giving themselves back the power of choice to what to wear in their daily life like as uh, like I see that uh, many like uh, Z generation, new generations are totally different like uh, uh, with like what they choose uh, to wear in their daily life. And uh, so you can see also the next page, like in page 35, yeah, it's the, these are some styles that uh, especially the one in the right and the one in the left. You can see this kind of styles nowadays in different uh, uh, places in the world. So I'm talking, trying to talk about like how uh, through fashion style and design and giving our, uh, the power of choice to women to uh, choose what to wear. Uh, they kind of in a like, um, daily uh, fight. So I remember living in Iran. Every day, like I'm leaving home, I should be worried if I'm gonna be get arrested with this style or not. But I've been arrested many times because of my style there, and also I've been arrested there as designer because my shirt photo in the social media, my model didn't wear the hijab two of my exhibitions got 
uh, cancelled. Um, so if if uh, you it's so common that you be a designer and owner of a, a fashion uh, like social media page in Iran and like in one night all you you got like as a designer in social media disappear you get arrested they delete all your photos they uh, you can go to jail or you have to pay a lot of penalties and as I know that only in uh, last year, hundreds of fashion uh, designers and fashion bloggers in Iran got arrested, and most of them had to live in Iran. So we, you can see a lot of like fashion bloggers and fashion designers living in Turkey on, or other countries around Iran because of what they are doing. They're doing only their job as designers or bloggers. And fashion always has um, had been like the red line of the Islamic Republic. Uh, so like also I see designers as like hidden army through this revolution, like how uh, they're, they are doing and bringing new ideas and designs and color to our, to the daily life for uh, new designs and like giving the more power of choice to women. So, and yeah, these are the photos that for of my last exhibition in Iran that got canceled in the first day because just not having a job on these photos. And so for my thesis, I am showing a set of clothes that trying uh, to show the, uh, how uh, through fashion and style the, uh, we uh, brought kind of change in the society. So uh, thank you so much, Sanaz. That is really incredible work. It's so great to hear about your practice. Um, so I have a couple questions um, that I thought I would just ask both of you. And again, you can you can both both answer both answer them in relationship to your particular the mediums. Um, starting with you, Pupe. Um, and maybe even thinking about how this has just changed since we last spoke about this, but your own understanding, I mean, also I'm thinking about what's happening in Gaza right now, um, but your own sense of the importance of, um, of story and witness and memory mm -hmm. in terms of um, resisting and refusing violence um i know it's kind of a broad question but maybe even particular to you know to this book that you translated the importance of her story coming out in a place you know in in potentially every place but the country in which she lives mm -hmm. um thanks for that great question um jay um before Talking about that, I want to just um, go back to what Sanaz was sharing and say, like, between the time, like, I was a teenager in Iran or even, like, in my 20s, and now there's so much difference that's, like, when I see pictures of, like, friends or even, like, just social media pictures from Tehran, I'm, like, I can't believe it's the same city. Like, mm. I couldn't imagine myself, like, in that space. Like, it's it has evolved and changed so much. Um, but also, like, this, um, the memories of, like, being arrested for what you're wearing or what you're, even, like, your mom or your, like, older, like, female um, 
people around you were wearing and being arrested like when you're young I think all of us share some of those memories um and to talk about like the fashion design like every time I see like these like social media pages I'm like I just want to go back and buy some things like they're so amazingly like inspiring like the artistic um explosion that we see like in the past decade it's just like so wonderful so I just wanted to acknowledge that and then come back to your question um um the importance of like witness narratives and like documentation and I'm glad you made the connection with like the genocide happening in Gaza today um when the woman life freedom um, revolution started I was teaching a class on Iranian literature um to undergrads um we were reading just like short stories novels poetry um listening to Iranian music um walking like in the streets of Tehran with like YouTubers and just like talking about literature in context, right? Not just like something on the page. And then the protest started and it was amazing to share that historical moment with students and be like, you see like literature doesn't happen in a void, right? These stories that we have been reading, you could see like traces of this um, movements like in the stories you could see the tensions in the stories you could see how literature was both like kind of like reflecting back on these um, social um, issues but also like kind of like prophetizing like um, mm -hmm. what was gonna happen right so in a way like reading um, these pieces of work which they were not necessarily like considered like political writing. They were just stories. They were just poems, right? But it wasn't a surprise to see where things were going, how things were um, evolving in the streets. Um, so part of the conversations I've had in the past few years is like, the documentation, the witness narratives, what is important is actually like um, to have a wide range of voices and also not um, limit ourselves to the work of journalists, which has its own importance. But we are seeing this today with Gaza as well, right? It's like the importance of like the daily stories that people ordinary people are sharing with the world from like their daily life um in gaza in um palestine um we read uh parts of uh, 1001 nights this quarter with my students just like the premise and the frame of like a woman telling stories to save her life right not being killed by the king and we talked about like how that seems far away but then that's exactly what Palestinians are doing today right they are documenting their lives to save their lives right mm -hmm. um, they're documenting the violence that's happening to them to be like stop what is happening right um, so this work of like documentation is important and it's important because language and art is one of the me like one of the main mediums we have right without language we could not do this work and then part of that language is also translation right without translation we would not be able to share these stories um and then again like the the difference between um like there are many modes of documentation that can happen, right? There's the documentation that happens like um, on different like news websites. There's a the documentation that is just like you documenting your daily movements or like writing your even like diary or, and then there's the documentation that is for example, fictionalized, right? It becomes like a historical fiction or even like completely like fantasy science fiction. So going like as far away from reality but you are still in conversation with the real right it's like how the conscious and the unconscious how the how the real and the imagination work with one another and that's how we can just um um it's these 
forms of documentation and witness narratives that allow us to see our connections to see our differences and to just think through what it means to be a human being, right? And the kind of choices that we make are informed by um, allowing ourselves to receive and be present with these narratives, right? Thank you. Thanks, Fupe. That's amazing. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, this is just a side comment. Like in Gaza, the Palestinian poets in particular have really been important in terms of reporting on and witnessing uh, in terms of what's happening. Um, yeah. yeah. So, um, Sanaz, um, I wonder if you could kind of talk a little bit about um, you know, the connection between, I guess, connected to what Pupe is talking about, the connection between fashion, you, you did mention it in your presentation, but, but between fashion and story and identity and just the importance um, that the connection between that autonomy and agency in choosing, you know, your own color palette and choosing the garments that you wanna wear how that might connect to a sense of story. Oh, I, I think you're muted, so. Sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, um, so um, I think it's, feels very bad that every time you are out in the streets feel a stress about what you have choose to wear that day for that your day so i'm trying to uh, through this work say that like uh there if like uh as women in the society, the power of choice are given to them, they could be like uh, in a, like, I don't know, it's like more, uh, because as we humans, like uh, we are born with the power of choice to choose what to wear. And when others decide for you, like, uh, what to wear, what to do, what's the like, uh, I don't know, uh, rule of modesty, what, it, what you have to like do as woman. They describe you as like, I don't know, as like a doll rather than a human in uh, those kind of like rooted rules. And they want uh, women to get inside. So as it's incredible how they changed the like scene of our national TV. I think in one of the, those slides, you were you saw for a moment that like a picture of Mullah with a, hit, a lot of hidden faces of women and children. And the other one was the scene of like our TV 40 years ago that women and woman and man like dancing and singing together. This mm -hmm. is the thing they want. They want to like hide the identity of uh, uh, women and have them just as like they be inside home, they give birth just to children and raise their ch children. These days they have the competition of bringing more children and just like they literally like advertising for it in the TV. So uh, these are all the ways they are trying to control and restrict women. But I think nowadays uh, with the like globalization and social media, they can't do it. And I think, uh, mm -hmm. As Pupe said, you can't believe these cities are like cities 10 years ago. And now it's like they have a really hard job. And uh, I hope they be done soon. Great. Thank you, Sanaz. Um, so uh, we have a 
about 10 minutes left, um, which gives us time. If anyone has any questions in the audience, I still, um, I have some questions still that I can keep running, but if anyone has any questions. Do you want to ask a question, Isa? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll keep going, I'll keep going. Um, so Pupe Sinaz mentioned social media. Um, I, Pupe, I wonder, and then Sinaz, this will be another opening for you just to expand, but I wonder, Pupe, if you could just talk about maybe at a, like, in a, more narrow space, what the social media experience was like for you, especially during the first couple months, um, you know, after she was, after Amina was, was murdered. I think this is a shared experience among Iranians in diaspora. Um, like you are glued to your phone. Like it's like a constant, um, refreshing, constant, kind of doing your own detective work to see like what new information you can find. Um, and again, like this is so different from like the experience of like 2009 when like um, citizen journalism just started, right? We didn't have this concept before 2009, um, which seems so long ago, but also like it's, it's such recent history, right? Um, so just like this, even with um, like many um, news outlets that uh, we have outside of Iran, um, a lot of their um, material is coming through social media, right? Like they get their hints through social media, even like uh, Masajina's killing, right? Social media was the reason that we know of it. Um, and then like how it just like, the story just like went, I mean, viral is the wrong word, but that's what it was, right? It was like, there was no denial possible anymore. Mm. Um, even though still they are manipulating that story, they are still like, the, the regime is still telling their own stories, right? Um, but it is in the power of social media. And I think another important factor at play with social media is again like these daily moments of documentation right so history is not the grand story anymore it's just all these like minor mm. details right it's the minor stories that are showing us the complexity of the situation um showing how multi-layered everything is right it's not just like a simple story that can be told you know in just like 10 minutes or something it's like in the complexity of all these layers are all like social classes um different social classes use of social media for example different um professions use of social media right different age groups using social media and when you look at like the trends of narratives you see like how how much life and how much like um how much even like tension, right? You see like the revolution in those like moments of like daily documentation. Um, and again, like a lot of these are not done for the purpose of I'm doing political work, but it's just like people being people, right? Young kids being young kids and documenting their lives and like showing their lives and sharing their lives. But um, when we see them collectively, when we start to, um, see connections, look, um, like ask questions, um, think about them in relation to one another. That's where like we are able to see like the larger story, the larger like narrative that comes to life through these smaller moments. Like um, for example, like one um, project that I'm working on right now is I'm translating um, just like diaries by um, an Iranian painter, a family member surviving a killing, right? So um, Nika, one of the teenagers who was killed um, during the movement, her aunt 
who is a painter, who's an artist, she started to write about like her experience of what this loss means. Or she even like put out a call of like, my niece is missing the call for like, does anyone know where she is, right? This was in the midst of the movement. Um, and she has been continuously doing this and you see like so many complex aspects of what does it mean to witness this? What does it mean to be part of like this um, movement? What does it mean to actually mourn the loss of like a younger, so like such a close member of the family? And doing this as an artist, doing it on a public platform is a lot of, um, what's the word? Um, she's, she's opposing a lot of taboos, but also like being very vulnerable on social media, right? What does it mm -hmm. mean to be like experiencing like such intimate um, moments and such in intimate transformation? on a public platform right and even though we consider it public there's still a lot that is not said on that public platform right so i think the social media platforms are pretty important and that's why they are also like illegal and banned in iran which is um its own story right because the regime uh, officials use social media themselves but then at the same time it's illegal so what does that say mm. Yeah, what you're talking about with the ordinary or the dailiness, it, it makes me think of Sadia Hartman and just her sort of getting us thinking about the violence within the ordinary, turning us away from spectacle mm -hmm. um, and the importance that how the that dailiness allows for a kind of specificity, which is humanizing. Um, so that's, yeah, that's very cool. The diary also being a kind of ordinary, you know, another form of, of the daily. Yeah. And especially to think that diary has been historically considered like a woman's kind of writing and not valuable, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sanaz, maybe you could expand a little bit about your own experience of witnessing, the revolution in the months after um, through social media, just your own sense of social media and your own experience with it. My own experience uh, for me, it was only a month after like I came to US, the movement started and as a person, I used to be in the streets most of the time while protesting. Um, it was a very hard time actually for me. And I was all the time thinking of like, I shouldn't be here. I should mm. could be there and be inside. But I really like, like kind of like uh, feeling powerful to do how like social media people are like, connected and united and uh, so social media like giving me uh, the like feel of power like mm -hmm. as, as like as uh, 10 years ago in a um in the like beginning of the green movement in iran to rule facebook a lot of people that uh, they found that they are not alone. We are a lot. There is a lot of us that we want the change. And actually it began from that time. So it was giving us all time. It's like uh, feeling safe that we are a lot. We, it's a lot of us that we want the change. So it's like come a way of like inviting more people to join us and feel at the same time it was so like sad witnessing what's going on in Iran and wanting to be there by their side but I was like calling my family and brothers go to the street go to the street and my mom was so no no don't tell them go to the street and I had this hard time I was saying my mom go to the street and like be their side and so it had like these kind of moments but yeah, 
it it was giving me the feeling of power that we are alert. Hmm. Yeah. Thank um... you. Oh, thank you, Sinas. Um, well, um, I just want to thank both of you again for being in conversation with with us and with one another. Um, and Pupe will be back, Sanaz. Pupe will be back here in June, um, oh, so we can we can reunite again um, mm -hmm. and continue the conversation. Um, let's give Pupe and Sanaz a round of applause. Thanks. Thanks for inviting us, Jay. Thanks for um, creating space to talk about this, as always. Um, Sana, so good to see you and Happy New Year again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, it was so good. Yeah. And Happy New Year to you and Happy Spring, everyone. <laughs> happy New Year. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, everyone Thank in the room and online.